Oh, I'd be brave if you're brave. I'd be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's lung cancer living room. We're so happy to have you all joining us from wherever you may be around the country or around the world. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Danielle Hicks. For those of you who may not know, I am Chief Patient Officer here at GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with our living room, it's a support and education series that we created specifically with patients and caregivers in mind with the aim of facilitating educational, educational talks um, from key opinion leaders um, in a format and language that uh, the layperson can easily understand. So we hope you'll enjoy tonight's living room. Tonight we have uh, Lori Fenton Ambrose, who is president and CEO of GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer joining us, as well as Francis Spruitt, who uh, has been a panelist on The Living Room before, for those of you who have been watching for a while. He is a lung cancer survivor and patient advocate extraordinaire. Um, tonight, we're going to be speaking about um, the importance or what we think is important to share with our community about GoTo, um, who we are, and what our overarching five-year vision is, um, built completely with patients in mind. Um, Moving forward, uh, what we're gonna be doing uh, with our living rooms is highlighting or spotlighting different areas of focus. And tonight, not only are we gonna be sharing with you what that overarching vision is, but we're gonna dig in a little bit um, into patient advocacy and why it's important to become a patient advocate. And as I said, um, Francis is no stranger to this area, so we're, we're thrilled to have him here tonight. I like our panelists and the people speaking to tell us a little bit about themselves why lung cancer is important to them, uh, and then we'll jump into tonight's program. So, Lori, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'd love to start with you. Oh. Well, Danielle, thank you. And to all of those who have tuned in again to this very special and um, signature program of GoTo Foundation that was founded uh, by Bonnie and Danielle to literally bring hope from what they would say their living room to yours and i am just so pleased to be side by side with bonnie and certainly the entire go-to team i've been a lung cancer advocate for over 16 years and there isn't a day that goes by that i'm not humbled by this opportunity to improve our collective outcomes and as passionate as ever about achieving these goals so uh, i've and touched by by this disease with friends who have had it, who have motivated me to elevate my voice and give my energy to doing right for a community that has long deserved it. So um, I'm a staunch patient advocate through and through and will continue to be for as long as I can. So thanks, Danielle. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Francis, what about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, uh, I was diagnosed, um, it was last December, actually, I was diagnosed 13 years ago. So um, I'm a non-small cell lung cancer survivor. Uh, I had a, a right upper lobectomy as well as uh, chemotherapy in the spring of 2008. And um, later on in the program, I'll tell you good people um, why I advocate and why it's important for us to advocate and why we need to get more survivors and anybody, anybody, anyone who is, uh, is concerned about lung cancer, get them on board and help us advocate for sure. Thank you, Francis. Um, okay, so with that, um, we're gonna pull up, this is a, it's a pretty detailed conversation. So tonight we're doing things a little bit different and we've got some slides that we wanna share with you. Um, that will really show you the work and the vision, uh, well, the vision of GoTo and the work that is, you know, kind of filling up the back end behind that. So, Lori, I'm going to turn it over to you. What we want to do tonight, because 
the go-to team is so excited about having spent some very important time together and really thinking about what it is that we could do to truly drive the next generation of survivorship and in our view, transforming survivorship. That's the whole focus that Bonnie and I have, have brought together as this organization has come to be. But the vision of really trying to be as, as Bonnie would say, aggressive and doubling down across the board in every sense of the word, we really want uh, to see accelerated progress in a way that we haven't realized before. And so this is our opportunity to share with all of you why we are here, what our vision is, and how I hope that we all can collectively work to, to achieve this and look forward to the dialogue to come around this. So it's what we refer to as calls to action. We are gonna be doubling down to transform survival by 2025. For those who may be tuning in for the very first time to the living room, it's just important to ground you a little bit with who we are. And first and foremost, most, we've been founded by patients and we serve our patient community. And it is about saving, extending, and improving the lives of those who could be vulnerable, at risk, and diagnosed with the disease. We have over 25 plus years of combined service to our community that is embedded locally and is sharing best practices now globally. And with our coming together now as GoTo Foundation, uh, we're stretching coast to coast and everywhere in between. But our principal offices are in the San Francisco Bay Area, Washington, D.C. We're among the highest performing charities and have received uh, the, the ratings that put us within that 7% uh, percentile of all charities that are reviewed. I um, mean, we feel uh, very humbled to continue in consecutive years to achieve this because we want all of you to know that what we do uh, is, is done with the highest level of governance and integrity and thought about making sure we're delivering for all of you. And through all of our programs, our outreach, like the living room, our events, uh, our newsletters, our community activities, we reach over 10 million people annually. And uh, we want to grow that as, as much as possible exponentially over the years. But it is important to know that we, we are reaching and we're connecting, um, but we still we still want more a part of that network. Obviously we're governed by a national board of directors. We have an extraordinary scientific leadership uh, board who provides us with the SAGE Council on, on our research and community-based uh, activities around early detection and treatments. And of course, with Francis here as a representative, we also have a very select group of people who work with us in a volunteer capacity in a more embedded way uh, to help us execute on our, our missions. And I say to, Fr to Francis and to uh, the other ambassadors on the council, a big thank you to, to the interest and the efforts that you provide. Uh, the next slide. So our vision is to double survival rates. They're approximately 20% now, but we are committed to seeing them rise to at least 40% by 2025. And our mission is transforming survivorship by saving and extending and improving the lives of our entire community. And I hope everyone will appreciate that our values cut us to and through our core and that we are always patient first that we will always be credible, community-minded, because we know the vast majority of people are accessing their care in communities most close to home. We are reliable. Whatever you need, we will be there for you. We'll be trailblazing. We don't mind being disruptors because sometimes you just need to be. And 
we will always be authentic. Our work is about meeting the needs of patients, filling gaps that exist, and doing exactly what we learn from all of you needs to be done. We're gonna empower everyone and ignore no one and do whatever it takes, no matter the need, whatever the need, and we're going to get it done together. So these are our North Stars, shall I say, our guiding, our guiding principles that, that bind us and our community so close together. By coming together as go-to foundation for lung cancer, we have brought the best under one roof and that it is now allowing us to provide our community with excellence across the entire continuum of care that always begins with patients and their needs and carries us through and then cycles back through this process. So our work is not just about early detection. It's just not about making sure that we can drive research. It's about how all of this interconnects from that continuum of care that begins with early detection to managing diagnoses, to making sure that the navigation of the clinical trials and getting comprehensive biomarker testing is occurring for everyone that will drive more precision-based medicine and that will improve that long-term high-quality survivorship. And from what we learn from that process, we will feed right back in and through. That is one of the beauties of our organization. There's no one else that works in this intricate way across the entire continuum of care as we do. So from a patient perspective, what we wanted to do is showcase that we are here wherever you may find yourself on your journey. If you are asking yourself, could I be at risk? Should I get a comprehensive biomarker test? What are my treatment options? Where do I go for screening and treatment in communities? How can I contribute to research? And how do I connect with community? And how do I elevate my voice? These are the questions that many of you may have been asking yourselves, along with many others that, that may not even be captured in this. But the point of it is to know that you are center and that whatever you may need and require we are here as a hub to provide that support, that information, that connectivity, and the opportunity to be engaged and involved in a way that makes sense for you. And I can tell you that if for whatever reason we can't answer that question, we know someone who can and would quickly direct you to a resource if it's not readily available among ourselves. This is an important one because we'll be cycling back to this uh, because it is one of the more important uh, core program areas that we operate in. We have been able to establish excellence as we refer to it, working with providers in community-based medical facilities all across the country. And what we now have are relationships that have levels of excellence in screening and through the care continuum now present in 45 states. You can obviously see where we have high incidence and where we need to bring even greater focus if there isn't uh, excellence so designated. But this is what is guiding our work in so many ways. And we are so proud to also share with you that as we continue to build out and expand this network across the country, uh, that we are now also designating VA medical centers within this network. So again, the intent is to be able to help direct you to the best screening and care that we have been personally engaged with helping establish so that we can point you in the right direction. But this will continue to be a guide star for us as we look at where we need to be and how we can be helpful to our community and particularly in places that have high incidence or have a more underserved and vulnerable community.
this really is game changing. Um, as Bonnie always likes to say, you know, 80% um, of cancer patients are seen in the community setting, right? So um, the 20% that might have access to academic centers where um, they have the, the luxury, if you will, of having um, medical oncologists and, and cancer care teams that get to focus just on one or two types of of, of cancer, uh, the community docs don't have that luxury, right? They treat whatever walks in the door. And as many of you know, um, lung cancer in particular is sort of, you know, leading the way when it comes to precision medicine and, and other cancers are now looking to us to see how we did it. But the expectation with how fast and furiously things are happening um, in lung cancer with, you know, new discoveries, whether it be drugs or diagnostics or you know, successes in clinical trials to expect that, you know, a, a, a medical oncologist, particularly in a more rural area, would know everything there is to know as it happens is really, in my opinion, unfair and unrealistic. So by creating this community, um, we're able to communicate directly with them, um, you know, as these developments happen and they're able to connect with one another and uh, learn from, from one another as well. So I just kind of wanted to stop there and give a little bit um, more detail about how really special this is and how this community of um, centers of excellence was built with the patients in mind so that they don't um, have to travel um, to get the you know best practices and standards of care community-based care that's what it's all about for us yes. because it is where we know our people need the greatest access. And if we can help set standards of excellence in best practices across this continuum, this is what is going to transform survivorship. And I know a lot of people that watch The Living Room, um, you're watching it because you have been diagnosed with lung cancer, right? And mm -hmm. when we talk about early detection, um, some of you may be thinking, well, what does that have to do with me? Because I already have it, right? But what I like to look, I like to look at continuing to have these robust conversations around early detection because a we know the earlier we find it the more likely we are able to treat and cure it um, and b your voices are extensions of ours right so those you know out there who may be at risk or who may qualify um, for screening based on the guidelines as they sit right now you're the ones who can help us get that message out to get more people screened. I think it's right now, the national average is around 4% of the millions of people who qualify for screening are actually utilizing um, uh, low dose CT uh, to try to find this cancer early. So, and it's scary and I know all of those things, but I think it's really important um, that our community, particularly the community that's watching the living room knows that they are the, the warriors on the ground to spread the word about screening for their neighbors, their friends, their their families, their mailman, you know, um, preach it loud and and uh, preach it clear. So many of the, the the viewers to the living room and and the people we we interact with, it it, it obviously start with their own diagnoses and and how how lung cancer has affected them, and and once you start moving um, uh, into advocacy, for instance, and that's what we're talking about tonight as well, you suddenly start realizing that. Yes, you, you advocate for yourself, but then in addition to that, you start advocating for people that you don't even know. It's actually a significant um, move you make in, in, in your emotional mind from being a patient to being an advocate and then doing it, doing it for more than just yourself. Um, so now let's get into a little bit of the details about how we are going to uh, focus on on transforming survivorship and doubling down again, as Bonnie often says. But if we break it down into four key goals, first, it's about how we increase the rate of lung cancers diagnosed early. And if you think about that, screening is such a critical piece, but it's not the only piece because the issue of what we refer to as incidental pulmonary nodules also is as important because of the, as I'm sure many watching may have experienced, being misdiagnosed uh, or incidentally found because of a completely separate um, medical situation. 
And so all of a sudden, when you fell off a ladder and had to have a, a CT look at you know, your, your chest, you learned, whoa, there's something there. So how do we best manage in bring finding incidental pulmonary nodules into that management process? So just like a screening encounter, they can also flow through standards and guidelines in a way that will give them the best targeted um, uh, management process. So you've got screening, you've got incidental pulmonary nodule management, and then the third piece of that is investing in that biomarker research that we ultimately hope may be able to help find cancers in the blood or in other uh, medical, biomedical samples, sputum, urine, things like that. So there, it's really three pronged. But if we bring attention and focus and strategies to how we can increase the rate of lung cancers diagnosed early, that's going to put us well on our way. So that's number one. But it's not just what you do with what you find. It's making sure that anyone diagnosed, everyone diagnosed, gets comprehensive biomarker testing so that we can better guide more precision-based medicine that has better outcomes because of markers that may have a, a, a specific targetable opportunity with some of the new drugs coming online. And again, many of you watching understand this because you have had testing and you've had a mutation or a marker identified where certain drug treatments or uh, immunotherapies will pose better outcomes in most cases. This is critical. So this is the kind of the one-two punch that if we can find them early, but then make sure if diagnosed, you're on the right treatment pathway, as we say, the right treatment at the right time, um, that is going to also be transformational. You know, this has been, um, I don't want to say a fight, but sort of, for a long time, right? Um, you know, and mainly in the later stage patients, those that qualified for this biomarker testing. But because of the research that's been done, and more recently, um, the Adura trial and what that showed, even in early mm -hmm. stage patients, yeah. having that biomarker testing done, regardless of stage, is proving to be more and more important. So it's more important than ever across all lung cancer diagnoses to really be focusing on this biomarker testing and and um, you know engaging with your healthcare. Uh, um, physicians and having the conversations with them if you have not had the, the biomarker testing to really understand what your cancer looks like. Precision medicine is what it's all about. And whether it's a marker that there is an FDA approved um, uh, therapy for, or if there's something in clinical trials, because quite often, and you know a lot of people are, are afraid of clinical trials, but quite often that might be the best first option for you based on that biomarker testing. And all the research that's happening there. So I just wanted to stop there really quick and give a, a quick explanation of why um, it's important that our community know about this, because again, we count on you all to, to spread the word of what's happening right now. We have, four, we have four goals, the two that I mentioned first, but again, and this is what we're going to actually draw out and talk about a little bit in more detail is how we are increasing that reach and the impact of our communities engagement. So it's continuing to build community, connect community, um, it, it involve community that will also contribute mightily to how we transform survivorship. No one should ever feel alone and no one should ever feel as though they're helpless because there are ways to be engaged, involved, and to be making a difference. Um, and of course, the last piece, how we can improve the quality of life as our community lives longer. And so much of that involves how we are sharing our experiences, how we, how we continue to collect information that can inform how to refine um, the management of the disease to the benefit. Of, of the quality of our lives. And that's one of the roles of our registry, among other things. So this that kind of lays it out. Those are the four key goals um, um, that we are focused on. And then if you think of it like a house, 
you've got these key goals as kind of part of the roof with the, you know, the center of the house with the roof um, as our vision of transforming survivorship, you need walls to then hold that up. So you have the programmatic work that is going to be connected to each of these. And that's what the next slide is um, illustrative of. Uh, it is our key programs that will be brought together um, to advance those four key goals. It's how we will continue to support our patients and caregivers, and there's no one who knows this better and is 120% um, about this than Danielle. It's how we are working to mobilize research and evidence uh, for impact. It's how we are maximizing those networks of medical facilities, providers and partners that that map of the country was representing. It's how we're leveraging public policy to make sure that our entire healthcare delivery system is meeting the needs of our community. And, and it's how we are serving as that go-to hub for you for information and support and engagement and involvement. So each one of these five programs is of the same strength and support that is sustaining those goals and our ultimate vision going forward. Specifically, the, the, the leveraging of public policy, right? Um, and, and we can quickly, real quickly, in, in our minds, and, and everybody understands that, it translates in real money, right? It's funding, it's commitments that that are that is being made at, at the federal level and state levels, right? And there's there's pots of money sitting there, and all we're asking is a fair shake. Give us the funding, and we'll, we'll drive it towards, you know, finding new treatments, finding more new medications. And it, and it's it's all you know your slides pr provided a, a real clear picture there, but it all is is to the benefit of of patients today and tomorrow. Um, so Francis, I want to start a little bit because you have been participating on the Hill in particular um, with us for many years now. Can you tell us a little bit um, about how you got started in that and what this participation uh, sort of looks like? Yeah, yeah, sure. So so that was. Um, it was in 2012. I actually had to look it up. Um, in 2012, I had my first summit in, in uh, Washington, D.C. And, and since then, I attended um, eight, uh, seven more summits. And, and the next summit, which will be in March, and, and you'll talk about it later, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And the next, the next summit, I, I, I will go again. And if I say I go again, um, in the past, we've always done in-person uh, uh, summits where a group of advocates get to, gets together. It's, it's a, a community that is singularly focused on the well-being of the lung cancer community, right? We, we, we come together as a group and we knock on doors and we make uh, our uh, representatives' lives somewhat, if, if not very uncomfortable because we, we, we tell them our stories this is this is really the key, and there's nothing mysterious about it. I tell my story about my lung cancer, and off we go. And and the the real magic actually happens when we tell that story over and over again. We do that in a, with a group of five to eight people, or whatever the, the makeup of the, of the team at, at the time is, and we keep telling that story. And we do that once. We do that twice and we do it like me now eight times and there's no doubt uh, advocates out there who have done it more often advocating at the federal and even state level has extraordinary potential to affect healthcare delivery um, increased research funding access issues coverage and reimbursement um, there are so many um, agencies involved and opportunities involved at both the federal and the state level that it really uh, can almost feel overwhelming uh, but it's where where there is a critical mass of of difference to be made and why um, having strategies you know at these um pressure points are so 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 important when i f the first time i went to the hill right i had no idea what i was doing and i was nervous and i was you know, I was terrified, actually, and 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 not even being a lung cancer patient, I can't 
and I won't even pretend to <laughs> to try to understand what that might feel like for somebody who's actually walking the walk, right? Um, but once you get in there um, and you realize what you're doing and how it's able to affect change is huge. And I think I didn't really understand that until I participated the first time, right? Because I had I had never had any reason. I was walking, you know, along in my life, kind of just like everybody else, you know, I just didn't know. And so thank you for, for um, giving a little bit more detail about that. Francis, how do you view um, the Voices Advocacy Summit and what has been your, your takeaway from the participation over many years? You literally walk up the hill and, and you go and visit these people. Well, today with COVID, we, we do that virtually. There is really no difference. Our, our mission is, is exactly the same, right? Um, because we're going to tell them our story. We tell them what we need and we tell them because we are here as lung cancer survivors, we need your help as, as representatives. That, that's really, so, so abbreviated, that, that's really the mission, right? And, and the power comes from the multitudes of us and we need more and more and we need to just keep, keep um, throwing people toward that mission. That's really what, what, you know, that's why I'm on this call to, to make people sign up and uh, become an advocate, really. And really in this instance, when we're talking about being on the Hill, doing it virtually gives folks who wouldn't have been able to come to DC to do this live an opportunity to participate and share their voice. So one silver lining as it pertains in particular to the Voices Summit is, it doesn't matter where you are in the country. Um, you don't have to physically be in DC to participate and to help us sort of spread the word, if you will, um, to our state representatives. So in your opinion, how does a patient advocate, uh, whether it be um, you know, a patient themselves, a caregiver, a loved one, telling their story either about themselves or their loved one help impact federal funding? So so it, it it's it's actually um, we know the lung cancer community knows how how many people are really affected right by by lung cancer it, it, it's like uh, a hundred and fifty thousand people die of lung cancer every year right now you, you you go to you go to those offices on Capitol Hill you knock on those doors and you find that most of them don't don't have a, they don't have a clue they have no idea how many people are affected. It, it's it's sad, right? So that that's one part of it. Um, they're in their positions of, of power, and they have no idea uh, how many people. And then, and maybe a, a little bit more political, how many of their constituents are or will be affected by lung cancer? We need to tell them that, right? And um, we are there to tell them about our lung cancer journeys and our challenges. And, and we don't we don't do that just one time. I, I, I keep going back to this this same theme, right? I'm going to tell you one time. I'm going to tell you until I I am no longer around because that that's how it works. I'm going to repeat it over and over again, and and that's that was a, a really a, a powerful moment when when we sh when I shared my story. I usually go with my wife, and 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 we shared our story, and and the aide who we talked to, he recognized us. He's like, oh, there's Rosalind and Francis again. And so keep telling it and keep coming back. And, and, and they eventually, this is always how it works with, with the little drops, right? Eventually people will first ex uh, recognize it. They will uh, ac accept your plight, or a plight of the lung cancer community in this case. And then they will start moving towards, you know, doing doing the right thing it's really important to point out that it's an opportunity for education right because people don't know what they don't know um and there's nothing like you know this type of information coming from the horse's mouth i mean there's plenty of things in our lives that we don't know about yeah. until it impacts us and um it just what you're saying is kind of resonating with me in that sort of why it's so important not just that we educate our own community and our our, you know, whether it be uh, our patients or, or healthcare professionals, but also um, those serving at, serving us up on the hill, right? Our representatives up there, they don't know what they don't know. Um, so and it's it wildly important that we help them understand. You know, when we started this journey many years ago, 
I didn't even know my my district representative, right? And and Mike Thompson and and us, we we are like we're we become friends, right? And and through through advocacy, you, you meet these people, and and it turns out these are just normal people, right? <laughs> they just happen to be in a place where they can actually help us and, and make a difference. That that's just awesome. Yeah. Francis and I go way back, and um, I we've been together walking those halls, and and it is it, it, you you feel like you've taken three steps ahead and then two steps back because every two years Congress changes, members leave, staff move on, and so that is why to Francis's point, the import of of just staying steady and continuing to educate. Danielle, as you were saying, because what you learn is that it's either, wow, I didn't know that, or yes, my family's been touched by it too. And it may be the first time that they've even publicly acknowledged it. So at the end of the day, what we do is strategically think through what it is we need Congress to do, and then structure our calls to action accordingly, whether it's through our women legislation, securing uh, multiple millions of dollars in dedicated research pipelines, making sure that when we get breakthroughs, that they're covered and reimbursed so that people can afford to take them, and that we are also working to ensure that healthcare delivery is really reaching those most in need. So these are just some of the you know, things that we have to think through each Congress that may have a different um, personality, shall we say, and different issues that, that come forward, but it's how we stay steady, continue to educate, and continue to ask for the help and support that this disease is so deserving of. And we have been achieving some great outcomes, not clearly enough, but we are making progress and we wanna really um, you know, accelerate that and the more people that we can have a part of this um, advocacy effort, I think the better we'll be uh, collectively as as a community. Um, Francis, um, last question, and I because I know you you've participated in advocacy events inside and outside of policy um, for multiple years now, better part of a decade, right? Um, in your opinion, how is this summit unique, or what are some of your takeaways from participating in this summit? It's it's pushing that boulder upwards. You can't do that by yourself. Mm -hmm. Only, well, yeah. we have made the choice to do that uh, during the summits, right? And of course, there's all kinds of other activities outside of that. But it's it, that activity. For me, it it created a purpose in my life. O oftentimes, we we wonder why did I get lung cancer, right? And and for and it's not for everyone, but I'm sure some of us are like, this is why I got lung cancer, because now I can do something that is valuable and important for other people, for myself and for other people, to to you know get recognition uh, at the federal level, at state level, and then drive money towards just a better situation overall. That that's purpose in life to help people. You said it beautifully and the smile on your face speaks even louder um, uh, to your point about being able to, and you said something earlier, I think that's important, you know, when, when you're first diagnosed, it's a scary place, right? And so getting your bearings around what that di diagnosis means and what, you know, your treatment plan is and all of that, of course, takes precedence, but there are multiple opportunities to engage after that and to your point do something about it. Most of you know, or all of you know, I'm going to say it anyway, that lung cancer impacts men, women, families. It impacts people, right? We are all part of this community who wants to help affect change. And this year's uh, Voices Summit thing, theme is to tell Congress it's personal. Whether you're a patient, a caregiver, a researcher, nurse, physician, advocate, um, we encourage you to attend this event and let your members of Congress know how lung cancer affects you and how so many face this disease with courage and hope. Um, so together, we want to go up on the hill virtually, albeit, and tell Congress that it is personal um, and let them know that they can help to make a huge impact by elevating lung cancer awareness and increasing 
the much needed uh, research dollars. Your voice and story can make these goals a reality. For those of you who have participated, you know a little bit about what to expect at the summit, but for those of you who haven't, um, it's three days, five hour days filled with multiple things. It's not, it's not just about going to the Hill. There's keynote presentations by expert speakers, uh, breakout sessions for survivors and caregivers, families and friends, uh, the Lung Cancer Living Room. We will be hosting another living room um, at the summit, uh, focusing on COVID and lung cancer and some of the research that's going on there as well as vaccines and rollouts of those vaccines, uh, advocacy, education and training, networking, um, as Francis you know, alluded to, and the opportunity to connect with others like you. Uh, there's a virtual exhibit hall where you can go and talk to the folks who are sponsoring and exhibiting and talk to them personally about what they're working on in lung cancer. And then of course, an online um, action toolkit to help you better understand what you can do, not just during the summit, but really throughout the year to help um, advance the cause in this way. Um, again, I'm encouraging everyone to, to register uh, for the congressional meetings. We handle the scheduling, so it's really a no brainer. Nobody has to do anything. You just need to bring your voice tell your story, um, again, help them understand why it's personal. Um, so for those of you who are interested, please go to our, our website at gotofoundation.org. It will be a rewarding, a rewarding experience. I want to uh, mention that we currently have hundreds of people registered, which is fantastic. We have representation from 34 states, but there's always room for more. Like as, as we've been kind of the theme throughout this has been, we, we can't have enough voices behind this. So I'm gonna call out some missing states. And if you're watching, um, or you know somebody from one of these states, uh, maybe give a, a little push to have them uh, potentially register and participate. So it's Alaska, Arkansas, Idaho, Maine, Mississippi, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Mexico, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Utah, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wyoming. We are calling you. We are calling out to you to come and join us um, again, March 23rd through 25th. This is an extraordinary way to feel a sense of community. You are coming together and doing something that is so impactful for anyone that is touched by this disease and what we are hoping to, to achieve by elevating our voices. And it is personal for all of us. And the more we let our elected leaders know the more we will achieve uh, to to transform survivorship. Uh, so we just look forward to to being together, not in the perfect way that we've all enjoyed, which was a real sense of camaraderie and arms around each other, literally. But um, we're here for you. This is just one element of the many things that we do to bring our community together, but with so many other programs that are there to be of help to you. Um, throughout your journey, wherever you may find yourself. So I'll close out with that. Lung cancer, it's personal. Hi, I'm Denise. I'm a 10 year survivor of stage four lung adenocarcinoma. Lung cancer, it's personal. Lung cancer, it's personal. Lung cancer, yeah, it's personal. My name is Giovanna Maria Portillo. I am a stage 1B lung cancer survivor from Phoenix, Arizona. Lung cancer, it's personal. Lung cancer, it's personal. Lung cancer, it's personal. Hi, I'm Dr. Karen R. Scott. Lung cancer, it's personal. Lung cancer, it's personal. Lung cancer, it's personal. Lung cancer, it's personal. I think it's important that we show just a few of the many faces um, and advocates who are working alongside with us so passionately day in and uh, day out. And then, of course, it goes without saying um, um, the support that we receive uh, in order to bring this program to you uh, every month. So um, Janssen, uh, we have Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Lily, Merck, Novartis, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making it possible for us to uh, bring this 
to our uh, amazing community. So thank you all for participating tonight. I am shocked that we are only four minutes over because there was so much to cover, but I think, uh, I think we all did such a great job. So thank you all, uh, have a good night, and we'll see you next month. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see.